Good afternoon all. Welcome to USA Global Affairs Talk Series organized by the Center for International Studies in collaboration with the Center for Corporate and Community Development. I'm Dr. Tan Wei Yi, the chairperson for the Center for International Studies. I will be your moderator today. It's been five months since Russia launched a full-scale attack on Ukraine on 24 February 2022. Yet the Russians have failed to achieve their objective and Ukrainian forces have carried out successful counterattacks with the weapons supply from the West. Nevertheless, the fighting has clearly exhausted both sides. Until now, the war is still no end in sight. Apparently, the war has brought about disastrous results for all the countries in the world. Why did the Russian President Putin launch the war? Today, we are honored to have Professor Wu Yishan as our speaker to explain the causes of the Russia-Ukrainian war. Professor Wu Yishan is Distinguished Research Fellow and Founding Director of the Institute of Political Science, Academia Sinica, Taiwan. He is an academic of Academia Sinica, elected in 2016. He is also Professor of Political Science at National Taiwan University. His major interests are in political and economic transitions in ex-socialist countries, constitutional engineering in nascent democracy, and theories of international relations and cross-Taiwan strict relations. He has been a pioneer leader in Taiwan's semi-presidential studies and theorizations of cross-strict relations. His area focuses are Taiwan, mainland China, Eastern Europe, and Russia. He has authored and edited 24 books and published more than 150 journal articles and book chapters in both English and Chinese. Today, Professor Wu is going to talk about the causes and the latest development of the Russia-Ukrainian war. His talk will take around one hour, then we will have a Q&A session. Please post your questions on the chat box so that we can read your questions to Professor Wu later. Professor Wu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Down. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to talk about this very important subject, which is my research interest. And um, I think it's also a great uh, concern of all the people in the world today. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint. Today, we are going to talk about the Russo-Ukrainian war. Now, I think the big question that we all have is, how did it start? Um, I think it has to do with the Russian perception of their security and nationalism. And because it is Russians, it's um, Vladimir Putin who launched the war. So we have to read into Russian mind in order to understand why the war uh, was started in the first place. On February 24th, Russian President Vladimir Putin said, I made the decision to hold a special military operation. Its goal is to protect the people that are subjected to abuse, genocide from the Kiev regime for eight years. And here he is referring to the two separatist republics in Eastern um, Ukraine that was established in 2014. And to this end, we will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. So that's the official um, reasons for Russia to launch the war. Now let's take a closer look. Here Putin talks about which means special military operation. Now, if you are in Russia, you cannot refer to this war as a war. You have to refer to it as otherwise you will be in big political trouble. And the reason is, I think Putin would not want to characterize the warfare in Ukraine as a formal war. Uh, because that would uh, make the whole society very nervous and think that there might be a mobilization and that would reduce people's support for his 
uh, activities. Nowadays, a lot of Russians can simply say that, okay, we have a military operation. We had one in Syria, right? We also had one in Georgia. That's not a big deal. Um, so that's the reason for Putin to insist on calling the war a special military operation. And the reasons for launching this special military operation is to demilitarizatia e denazificatia. Um, demilitarization and denazification. Now, what does that mean? Actually, these two goals are from the Allies' policy in occupied Germany right after the end of World War II. We all remember that the Allied forces defeated Germany and took it um, into four parts. They occupied the whole country. And there were four goals at the time for the Allies. Uh, the first one is demilitarization, second one, denazification, and then decentralization and democratization. Putin refers to the first and second goals um, at the end of World War II. Now, why would he do that? because we have to know that World War II is still very much alive in the minds of the Russian people, especially after Putin took political power. He um, repeatedly um, refreshes the memories of World War II in the minds of the Russian people, uh, let them know that the Russian uh, people, the Russian soldiers, they have defeated Nazism, and this is very glorious. Um, so Russian nationalism and uh, the Russian victory or Soviet victory um, during World War II are combined. So he used those terms to invoke people's feeling about patriotism. And more specifically, demilitarization is about Russian security. And denazification is for Russian ethnic linguistic group rights or Russian nationalism. And these two are very important for Putin and not just for Putin, but for ordinary Russian people. The first one is uh, we need to safeguard Russian security. And the second one is that we need to um, safeguard the ethnic and linguistic group rights of Russians, namely Russian nationalism. So these two are the major goals. Now, let's take a look at security first. Uh, in this map, we can see three lines. First one is this um, deep, dark blue line and the light blue one, and uh, there's a yellow line. What does that mean? In 1949 to 1989, namely during the period of the Cold War, the Soviet, Russian Soviet, um, control um, reaches to um, Germany, uh, the border of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Yugoslavia was quite independent from Moscow's control. So basically we can use this dark blue line to show the border of Soviet bloc and the Western bloc or NATO. So that was the borderline between 1949 and 1989. And lo and behold, in 1991, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the line, the borderline for Moscow, for the new Russian Federation has retreated to the light blue line, which means the whole Eastern Europe, from a uh, Russian's perspective, was lost to the West. And the only historical line that we can think about that resembles the current light blue line is this yellow line. And this yellow line was the borderline of the Russian Empire in the 17th century to be precise, in 1667, that is after the Treaty of Androsova. So what we are seeing is from 1989 to 1991, the Russian border 
was pushed back by three centuries. That is back to the 17th century. Obviously, Russia will feel threatened by the incessant expansion of the Western Bloc and the shrinking of its territory. And we can see this pattern. It's always the countries that were originally in the Soviet bloc or even uh, a constituent part of the Soviet Union falling into the Western um, alliance, Western bloc. And it was always first NATO and then EU. So Czechia or the Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland, they became members of NATO in 1999 and then members of EU in 2004. So first NATO and then EU, right? And then Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia and Slovenia, they became NATO member. And then in the same year, EU member, 2004. And Bulgaria and Romania, NATO member, 2004 and then EU member 2007. So the same pattern, right? Croatia becoming a NATO member in 2009 and then EU 2013. And we have three Western Balkan countries that have already gained NATO membership, namely Albania, Montenegro, and Macedonia in 2009, 17, and 20 respectively. And they are all candidates of EU. And finally, we have a bunch of countries from Armenia all the way to Uzbekistan, and they have partnership for peace relationship with NATO. And three of them, Serbia in 2012, and Ukraine and Moldova just most recently in 2022, they are candidates for EU. So the whole pattern is very clear. All those countries were regionally under the Soviet influence or part of the Soviet uh, Union or Russian Empire, now they have joined first NATO and then EU. First military alliance, and then they would be consolidated as a constituent part of the European Union. The two Western, main Western organizations are expanding to the East. Um, um, without stop, all the way to the border of Russia. So from Russia's perspective, you are approaching my border. You are a hostile military bloc, and, and you are consolidating your relationship in a European Union, which you deny me the, um, uh, the possibility of entering. So Russia feels very threatened. This is perception not just of Putin, but of the Russian elite, and not just Russian elite, but the Russian population at large. And this happened under the ailing Boris Yeltsin and uh, Putin. So at the time of the fall of Yeltsin, uh, the rise of Putin, um, Putin um, became the leader of Russia when Russia was extremely vulnerable and weak. And then he saw under his eyes one after another um, former Soviet bloc countries or former Soviet republics going over to the other side. But he had a dream, a dream of a strong Russia, Virigaya Rusia. And he built a system, the system that we call uh, Putin or um, Putinism, which is a mixed system. Um, it's politically, it's no longer a communist party dictatorship, but nor is it a Western democracy, but a sovereign democracy. A sovereign democracy is a Russian version of competitive authoritarianism, which means that if you take a look at the politics of Russia, uh, they hold regular elections. They elect their public officials. They have opposition parties and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, their media is suppressed. Uh, their opposition figures are uh, sometimes um, tortured 
um, or even kidnapped and sometimes uh, murdered. And so you do not have a level ground for the competition, political contestation between the ruling party and the opposition party. But you do have regular elections, you do have opposition parties. So it's not as totalitarian as, for example, the People's Republic of China, but nevertheless, it's uh, not a democracy, of course. So it's a system that is in between. And it's no longer economically a command economy, but nor is it a Western capitalist system, but a form of state capitalism. State capitalism meaning that uh, the uh, means of production are in the hands of the private individuals or private companies, but then the state exerts great influence in the economy. So it's not communism because under communism, everything belongs to the state, but nor is it freewheeling capitalism like uh, what you can see in the United States, but in between. So again, in between economic system. And as far as the foreign policy is concerned, it has shifted from a pro-Western, uh, we call that Atlanticism to a anti-Western Eurasianism. Now it happened both under Yeltsin and Putin. Yeltsin was originally very pro-West, but then when he realized that he couldn't get what he wanted from the West and then he turned to China. And it was the same thing on the Putin. Um, after 9-11 happened, Putin was the first world leader to call uh, Bush, uh, President Bush of the United States to give his condolences. So that was the time when Putin really tried hard to improve relations between Russia and the West. But Lord behold, in 2007, there was a turning point when Putin at the Munich a security conference made a very famous speech that he complained a lot about the United States controlling everything um, and so on and so forth. In 2008, there was this Russo-Georgian war that you know, the Russian army overwhelmed the Georgian army in seven days. And in 2014, there was this Ukrainian crisis. We are going into details of that later. And in 2015, uh, the Russians intervened in the Syrian civil war. And um, because of Russia and, and Iran's support of Assad, uh, the whole situation was uh, um, uh, turned upside down. And right now the Syrian government can control uh, the majority of uh, the population and land in the country thanks to Putin's intervention. So Russia emerged as a major political slash military slash energy world power and Putin enjoyed genuine domestic popularity. So that's Putin's China. Okay, and we can take a look at this. Uh, this is the 2018 Putin State of the Nation address. He addressed the nation by talking about Russia's six super weapons. Uh, like this is the, the new generation of international ballistic missiles. This is the uh, aircraft carried um, supersonic um, cruise missiles and so on and so forth. And, and at that time, Putin said something. He said, Nas nikto ne slusha, vas slushajte sechas. You never listened to, to me, to us. Now you listen. So what he's suggesting is that we have these very powerful weapons. You cannot just treat us as second class power in the world. You have to respect our ability, our power. So this is what in the minds of Putin. So he, he is thinking that the West has been taking advantage of Russia. Um, this NATO expansion and the European Union expansion just intolerable. And I have to put a stop to it. And Ukraine is the red line. And for Putin, Russia has been cornered. No Russian leader would accept Ukraine becoming a member of a military alliance targeting Russia. But Russia has no way to stop Ukraine from itching towards NATO membership. We will remember the strategic flirtation in 2008 on, at the NATO summit when actually the United States welcomed uh, Ukraine can become a member of NATO, but then um, Angela Merkel of Germany um, and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy of France said, uh, no, 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 this is going to antagonize uh, Russia. In 
2019, the Ukrainian constitution, and it was written into Ukrainian constitution that the country would join NATO and the EU. And in 2021, the newly elected president of Ukraine, Zelensky, he visited the United States and the US said that um, the US would support, support Kyiv's Euro-Atlantic aspiration. Now, what is a Euro-Atlantic aspiration? That's NATO. That's NATO. So the United States has been given green light to Ukraine. Um, and also there has been training and army of Ukrainian forces by NATO countries like the British. They have been training Ukrainian Navy like the Canadians, the uh, peace loving Canadians. They are training the uh, Ukrainian battalions on uh, the, the army and the United States has been providing all kinds of weapons. So Putin in December 2021 gave an ultimatum to both the United States and NATO, basically saying that you have to put in writing that Ukraine would never enter NATO and that you would put troops away from NATO members' border with Russia. Now, this is kind of ultimatum that only the strong country can dictate to the weak one, right? And so there was it was flatly rejected by the United States and the West. You must be kidding me. How can you give me this kind of ultimate and expect me to accept? But then the question can be asked, what if it were the United States that's in the same situation? Try to imagine if Russia is forming a military alliance with Mexico and then we'll be putting military bases We'll be installing um, weapon systems. We'll be sending troops to Mexico right across the border from the United States. What will be the response from the US? We all remember in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis when the Soviets wanted to put their missile system in Cuba. The United States, President Kennedy, threatened to use nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union to force the Soviets to remove their missile system <clears throat> from Cuba. So we know great powers when threatened will behave in a way that is very threatening to other people. And this is the mentality of Putin and the Russian elite. And there are Western realists who are sharing Putin's concerns. For example, everyone knows this person uh, he is in his 90s, right? Henry Kissinger. He says that if Ukraine is to survive and thrive, it must not be either side's outpost against the other. It should function as a bridge between them, <laughs> which means that he is subject to Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. And the uh, University of Chicago professor Mia Scheimer, he said that <clears throat> Moscow was not interested in making Ukraine part of Russia, but in making sure it would not become a springboard from Western aggression. So they are realists and they read Putin's mind and Putin is a realist. So for Putin, it is not us who is aggressive. It is you who is aggressive and we are simply responding to your aggression. But the security dilemma is this, Ukraine will not feel safe unless admitted to NATO, right? Because it's right on the border of Russia. And it was part of Russia for a long period of time in history. So it's very much afraid of Russia. So it wants to get into NATO to become a member of NATO. So NATO will protect Ukraine. So it's very natural. So that's the safety of, of Ukraine. But then, Russia will not feel safe if Ukraine is a NATO member. Because if Ukraine is very large, it has a, a big population, it has all kinds of resources. So if it falls into a hostile group, then Russia will not feel safe. So you have a security dilemma going on. The security of Russia and the security of Ukraine are zero sum. If you increase the security of Ukraine, you will decrease the security of Russia. If you increase the security of Russia, you will decrease the security of Ukraine. And the war broke out 
right in the middle of the security dilemma. Now let's move to uh, the second reason for the war. It has to do with ethnic linguistic uh, rivalry. The East Slavs, um, the, the Russians, the Belarusians, the Ukrainians, uh, they um, belong to a group that we call East Slavs, we have West Slavs, you know, the Poles and Czechs and so on, etc., and, and the, the uh, South Slavs. The East Slavs, they were brothers and sisters at the time of the Kiev and Rus. Uh, you can see from this um, painting, the East Slavs are welcoming um, the Lulix. Lulix are a, a warrior. Uh, family from Scandinavia. So the first dynasty um, in um, Kievan Rus is the Lurik dynasty. Now this Kievan Rus is very large, right? Its territory reaches out all the way from Scandinavia, uh, from the uh, Baltic Sea to Black Sea. So it's a huge country and the capital city is Kiev or Kiev. Uh, Kiev. But then things changed. At the time of Kievarus, Kiev, Kiev was the center of the East Slav states. Uh, it's, it's the origins of Christian religion, uh, center of everything, cultural, uh, economic activities. But after the rule of the Mongol Golden Horde Empire from 1240 to 1480, Moscow and Russia rose as the new political center. And and Ukraine, that was originally the, the center, the origins of culture and uh, of everything, was relegated to borderland. Actually, the, the name of the country, Ukraine or Ukraina, means border. And Russia, um, centered on Moscow, fought several wars with Poland and Lithuania and the Ottoman Empire for control of Ukraine. Russia gained the east flank of the Dnipr at the expense of the Poles, and that was in the 17th century, and then South Ukraine at the expense of the Turks in the 18th century. So you have a very strong Russian presence in the south and eastern part of Ukraine. It's very, very important because it has very um, um, strong impact on the political and um, cultural uh, reality on the ground in today's Ukraine. Now, let's take a closer look. Now, you can see that this is Ukraine, right? It has three colors. The blue ones means by 1700, it's already been controlled by Russia, the Russian Empire. The blue one means that um, it's controlled by um, Poland. Poland, Lithuania is a common, is a common uh, wealth. And the southern part is controlled by the Ottoman Empire. So the first part, it is through the 1654 Pyrrhus Staff Agreement and the 1667 Treaty of Andrew Soba um, in the mid 17th century that Russia controlled the East Bank. This is the river Dnipr, the, the largest uh, river that separates Ukraine uh, into two halves. So the Eastern half was taken by the Russians. It actually was the uh, Ukrainian hetman um, who submitted the uh, territory to Russia uh, to seek protection of Ukraine from uh, the control of, of Poland. But anyway, in 1654 and uh, through 1667, uh, a 13-year war was fought between Russia and Poland. So Russia got this part of uh, Ukraine. And this is the southern Ukraine. Throughout the 18th century, Russia gained territory bordering Azov Sea. This is Azov Sea. So this is the, the borderland. And Black Sea from Ottoman Turkey. So this is the southern part, basically, the southern part of Ukraine. The uh, Russians got it in the uh, 18th century. And this is the third part. The third part is Western Ukraine. 
and the third part was gained by the Russian Empire at the end of the 18th century through the second and the third partitions of Poland. And that happened in 1793 and 1795. After 1795, Poland ceased to exist in the European map. Um, Russia got a big chunk of Poland and part of it is Ukraine, uh, Western Ukraine. So number three. And number four is the far west, because this part of Ukraine fell into the hands of Austria when the partitions of Poland happened. It then, when Poland re-emerged after World War I, again become part of um, the Polish state. And then it was taken by Stalin during uh, World War II. So territory scanned by Austria and ultimately fell into Soviet hands during World War II. Now we can see, this is the Ukrainian map and the Eastern part was part of Russia, has been subject to Russification for three centuries. You have a lot of Russian people, you have a lot of people speaking Russian language, they are at ease with Russians. They consider Russians to be their brothers and sisters because they've been together for 300 years. And then we have the southern part of Ukraine that uh, Russia took from um, Turkey um, being with Russia for 200 years, including Crimea. And this part, Western Ukraine, for over 100 years. And this part of far west, for 50 years. You can imagine, of course, that different, there will be different people with different identities, speaking different languages, worshiping different religions across Ukraine. So this has very deep political impact, different uh, historical experience and lens of Russification for different parts of Ukraine suggests a decreasing gradient of Russophilia, the feeling, a uh, positive feeling towards Russia. As we move from the southeastern parts of the country to the northwestern region, the latter being a stronghold of Ukrainian nationalism and Russophobia. Western Ukraine, particularly Lviv, became the birthplace of Ukrainian nationalism and bastion of Ukrainian independence for very good historical reasons, right? The national anthem, Shinyev Mirla Ukraini, Islava i Bolia, was first sung in Lviv as the Soviet Union was collapsing. So it's very symbolic that this happened. So you can see Russian as mother tongue as the uh, primary language spoken in families on, you have a very clear line, the east and southern parts of Ukraine. Many people there speak Russian. And the Russians as a minority group, that is ethnic Russians, they are also concentrated in the eastern and southern parts of Ukraine. So the Ukraine, in Ukraine, you have a political divide along the ethnic linguistic line, the Northwest versus the Southeast as a result of history. So history really matters. And we can see the result of presidential elections, namely the historical pattern of cultural and linguistic divide in Ukraine expressed um, themselves in the presidential elections. Now you can clearly see that there's a dividing line. Whenever you have a candidate coming from the East and other from the West, the East candidate would advocate a friendly relationship with Russia. The West candidate would advocate for a stronger ties with Europe, with the West. Then the voting behavior is for the Eastern and the Western, uh, the Southern part of Ukraine to vote for the East candidate and for the Western part of Ukraine to West to vote for the West candidate. In 1994, um, Kravchuk, um, someone can even say he's the founding father of, um, of Ukraine, um, he um, won the, the, Western, the Western part. And then uh, Kuchma, 
the eastern part. In 1999, because these two uh, gentlemen, Kuchma and Smenenko, they both came from uh, the east, so you don't find a clear dividing line. But again, in 2004, uh, Yanukovych from the east got the eastern votes, and Yushchenko from the west got the western votes. It's a clear line, right, dividing uh, Ukraine into two halves. And then again in 2010, when you have Timoshenko representing the West and Yanukovych the East, you have this dividing line. So um, where uh, did this uh, dividing line come from? Uh, it, it comes from history. In 2004, we all remember there is an Orange Revolution. Orange Revolution happened when you have an East candidate and West candidate, and they competed. And then in the first round of the presidential election, the East candidate Yanukovych won. But then the, the, um, the masses, those supporting the West candidate, supporting um, Yushchenko, they went to the streets. They claimed that the, uh, the election was rigged. It was not an, a fair election. And then they were jubilant because the, the court annulled the uh, result of the first round. And the momentum then shift to, the, um, to Yushchenko. And Yushchenko, and this is Yushchenko and the Timoshenko, this group won the presidential election. Now, from what we learned from the report of the um, media dominated by the West, it is, you know, the story is, runs like this. A pro-Russian regime was overthrown and the flawed election was rectified. But then if you're living in the eastern part of Ukraine, or if you are in Moscow, you will be thinking that a pro-Western coup was launched to grab political power. So from that time on, in the minds of uh, Putin, of uh, Russians, or uh, people in, uh, some people in the east, uh, Kiev has been controlled by the uh, pro-Western camp through uh, revolution on the streets and not through electoral politics. After 2010, when Yanukovych, he won the presidential election in 2010, he, he was a East uh, president. That is, he is favoring good relationship with Russia Ukrainian politics was um, on deep in the mass of um, the East versus the West, and particularly over language. For language, now the Russians obviously are the minority, uh, accounting for like 17% of the population, but then Russian speaking population is much larger. Uh, so those people will want to speak Russian and will want to treat Russian as a national language. Um, but that official status was denied. So they were demonstrating and it was saying that we want to speak native uh, language. Uh, we want to speak our mother tongue. And this is the fist fighting. <coughs> uh, for a person from Taiwan, I'm quite familiar with this fist fighting in um, the, uh, the parliament, in our uh, legislative run. Uh, we can see this. Uh, quite often. But those gentlemen are really very ferocious fighters, right? Okay, so we have fist fighting Rada, namely the, the parliament of uh, Ukraine, for giving Russian official status in the East. That was in May 2012. It's a lot of fighting between the two. And then Yanukovych, because he wanted to revive the economy, he then flirted with the West and actually got and um, the West uh, gave Ukraine um, the uh, possibility of joining the EU by first signing an agreement of association. You need to sign agreement of association before you can go through a very lengthy process and ultimately that may lead to your inclusion into European Union. So he tilted to the West but then Putin obviously was very annoyed because you know, Yanukovych uh, is supposed to be pro-Russia. So Putin put a lot of pressure on him, forcing him to give up signing that um, 
association agreement. And then talking about probably joining the Russia dominated Eurasian Economic Union. A lot of people in Ukraine are saying, are you crazy? Uh, you don't want to join EU, you want to join um, Russia? So they went to the streets, they occupied the Maidan um, square, the major square in the capital city, Kyiv. You can see this is the um, European flag, European Union flag. And then it turned ugly. Um, this person is throwing Molotov uh, cocktail at the police. And it says, Revolution. Revolution. Okay, Maidan 2014 was a victory for the West Camp, so to speak. Uh, Yanukovych was ousted. He fled to Russia. So Kiev fell into the hands of the pro-Western group. And from the Russians' point of view, in 2004, you launched a revolution, street protests that stole away from me, a pro-Moscow president. And 10 years later, you did the same. Yanukovych is going to sign an agreement with Russia so that there will be close economic relations between Ukraine and Russia. And then you forced him to flee the country. And then your country is going west to join NATO, uh, to join European Union. So what Russia did was to annex Crimea and then helped establishing two separatist republics. One is the uh, Donetsk Narodna Respublika, the other one is Lugansk Narodna Respublika, and the DNR and the LNR, two separatist republics. And this is Crimea. Russian took it away and it became a part of Russian Federation and, and two separatist uh, republics also uh, formed here. So we can see um, on nationalism, Ukraine has been busy building a new national identity through de-Russification. While Russia considers its responsibility to support the Russians, ethnic and cultural in Ukraine to fight um, what they would consider this um, uh, uh, discrimination against the Russians. Um, the, the divide between the East and the West um, the very high nationalism feelings on both sides. Um, here, Russia and the Ukrainian goals are also zero sum. So the first reason for the war is security from Russia's perspective. The second reason is nationalism. And uh, on security, Russia and Ukraine, they are zero sum. On nationalism, Russia and Ukraine uh, are also zero sum. So we go directly to the war. From 2014 to 2022, there are two burning issues for Russia. The LNR and DNR have become Russia's protectorates, Minsk one, Minsk two, namely some agreement that would give the two separatist republics some status of autonomy, um, but then they would not leave Ukraine. They would still be part of Ukraine. This kind of, of compromise agreement, um, people are not satisfied with it, of course. And Kiev has no interest in implementing either uh, Minsk I or Minsk II. Along the contact line, the contact line is the border between the two separatist republics and uh, the Ukrainian territories. There were reciprocal shelling, artillery shelling, uh, killing people on both sides. After 2014, Ukraine has decisively tilted to the West. And for what reason? Because the most pro-Russian parts of the country have already left Ukrainian politics, right? The far east um, part of Ukraine, um, part of Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, right now, they are under the, the two separatist republics, as well as Crimea. 
um, they have uh, a lot of Russian uh, minorities and Russian speaking people, they have left Ukrainian politics. So removing then the remaining Ukrainian politics would be further tilting towards the West, prompting politicians to compete in embracing Ukrainian nationalism and joining NATO and EU. And these pledges were written into the constitution in 2019. And the leadership change from Poroshenko, very staunch um, Ukrainian nationalist, uh, former president, leadership change from Poroshenko to Zelensky did not alter the two tendencies towards de-Russification and joining the West. So you can become more and more pro-West. Russia has already taken our territories, right? And has become um, more pro-Ukrainian nationalism. And this is Zelensky. He is the uh, leading actor as well as this is producer, the leading producer, Volodymyr Zelensky, of a TV series called Slucha Narodu. Slucha Narodu means servant of the people. And he turned himself into the president of Ukraine. Now, this is very interesting because in that TV series, he played the role of a history teacher who got inadvertently into the role of the president of Ukraine. He was an honest person. He was not a professional politician. And people liked him. People elected him president because of his honesty and so on and so forth. And then he used that. He used the popularity of himself as the actor and also of the TV series, and he created a political party by the name of Sloha Narodu, Servant of the People. And he got himself and that party elected into presidency and a majority of the parliament. So, you know, it's, it's, it's TV series um, turned into real life. Amazing. Although Zelensky won the presidential election in 2019 by taking a comparatively moderate position towards Russia, he nevertheless followed the structure forces in Ukrainian politics and doubled down on joining the Western alliance and taking a tough stance on separatist republics in Luhansk and Donetsk. He closed down the TV channel that is uh, owned by the opposition. He also put a major opposition politician, um, Ivichuk, in house arrest. American President Trump, during that period of time, was less interested in helping Ukraine. But Biden is different. Biden was much more eager to lend support. And that alarmed Putin. Ukraine was seen, from the Russian perspective, as being lost. And Putin launched the war. Now, Ukraine obviously was not prepared for this, but nor was Russia. Nor was Russia. The way Russia fought the war is a very clear indication that even the Russian military was not prepared for doing a battle in Ukraine. Now, uh, there are two stages of the war. In the first stage, we are seeing that the Russians, the forces are moving from north, um, along Kiev, um, Chinitiv, and Sumy, um, surrounding or near surrounding, nearly surrounding the big cities, but never able to get in. And Kharkiv, this is in the east, that's in the north, and Luhansk, Donetsk, and then uh, Zaporizhia, and then um, Kherson, and then uh, Mikolaev. So the first stage of Russian forces moving from north, east, and south France along the whole of the 1,700 kilometer border, making strategic mistakes and tactical blunders all along the way. Russia has only 200,000 troops. How could you imagine with that amount of troops to conquer a land with 44 million population? And it's the second largest country in the whole of Europe next to Russia itself. And there has been insufficient training and logistics. The BTGs, the battalion tactical groups are not working very well. The tanks are not supported by infantry. 
And it was strong resistance by Ukrainian forces. And they were not eager in having a duel with the Russian forces in the open field. But then they would hide behind the, uh, the buildings in the big cities, etc. And um, the Ukrainian propaganda was, war propaganda was very successful and the Western sympathy and support uh, also very strong. The Russians either stalled, they just cannot move into the major cities or they are forced to level the city to occupy it. Uh, so the things to what they, they, they do, if, if they move their tanks into the cities, it will be ambushed. So the way they do is very cruel way, they just bombed all the buildings, bombed them to the ground, level the city, and then occupy it. And that would obviously add to anti-Russian feelings and global condemnation of Russia. So that's what we are seeing. And this is very telling. In the past, if you fire a anti-tank rocket towards a tank, it will hit the well protected glasses, namely the frontal part of the tank. It's not going to penetrate into the thick armor of the tank. But then with the support of the javelin missile, it's a very smart anti-tank missile system. If you fight it at a tank, it will shoot up as high as 150 meters before plunging down and striking the torrent from above, which is the most vulnerable part um, of the tank thus blasting the turret away from the main body of the tank onto uh, the side of the road. This is the common thing you, you saw during that period of time, the early stage uh, around Kiev and so on and so forth. So the Ukrainians really come up with a very good fighting uh, resistance. It was a time when it seemed to be a possibility of peace. At the end of March, the, long, the war was uh, launched um, on February 24th, right? So the, at the end of March, a, a month has passed and Russia was unable to capture Kiev and forced to retreat. Negotiations were going on in Istanbul. They seemed to be leading somewhere. Ukraine may be willing to forsake its NATO bid. We all remember uh, Zelensky said something like, oh, I don't want to join NATO because NATO is uh, not delivering the kind of thing that I want. They would never come to help me and so on and so forth. And probably he would be willing to settle with Russia's promise to leave the newly acquired land in the south. So let's go back to the uh, 2014 um, boundaries. And the discussion of the status of Crimea, which is a very thorny issue, you uh, obviously cannot ex expect Zelensky to accept that uh, Crimea is part of Russia. But that discussion of the status of Crimea can be postponed, right? Can be a more favorable time in the future. Some people say that it's a Russian trap, but probably that's also a genuine opportunity to end the war. Um, nevertheless, it was lost because we find the Bucha massacre, because after the, the Russians pull back from the vicinities of Kiev uh, in Bucha and other places surrounding Kiev, there are uh, you know, people's body lying on the street with their hands tied in their back and they were you know, shot, um, executed. And, and a lot of bodies dumped into a mass grave. And then, on uh, April 12th, there was a sinking of Moskva, which is the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet or the, the glory of the Russian uh, Navy that was sunk. So these two things brought about new war momentum with Putin claimed to have committed genocide, you know, with Bucha, right? And Moskva sunk the loss of the Russian glory. Right after Russia announced pullback from Kiev, and a peace agreement loomed large on uh, March 29th. And these two incidents basically killed the possibility of ending the war earlier. And there are other things that are supporting the continuation of the war. Western support, New York, Prague, Berlin, unprecedented, uh, just unprecedented. Tallinn, Estonia. But then on the Russian side, you have this. That's March 
18th, commemorating the eighth anniversary of the, uh, Russia will not call it annexation, but integration of uh, Crimea and um, the uh, Russian Federation. So this was held in the Lushniki Stadium in Moscow, in, in Moscow. And Putin's popularity surged to 83% after the war. It was actually quite low uh, from you know, Putin's um, uh, standard, um, as low as 60%, but then it surged to 83%. And this is from Levada uh, Center, which is very reliable uh, public survey center in Russia. And in the other one, uh, um, you can also see um, Putin's popularity surged as a result of uh, the war. So uh, in February, before the war started, 67.2, and after that, 80, uh, 80%. For Zelensky, he was a highly unpopular president in um, 20, uh, 20, um, 2020, 2021. Before the war started, as you can see from June to July to October, do not approve as high as almost 60%. Uh, so very low approval rating, um, only less than 30% of people supported him. And yet after the war started, it, it soared to more than 80%. Of course they are fighting a war. So during this period of time, people are rallying around the flag. So Putin is popular, even though uh, much of the world is condemning him. And Zelensky is popular. You can see him every day, every night on, on national television, whatever country you are in. So that, that means that the, both leaders can command domestic support and international support. Um, especially on the side of the Ukrainians. And the second stage is the Russians, because they cannot achieve their original goal, they are scaling down their goals. Demilitarization of Ukraine has failed, right? As it has become impossible to stop Ukraine from getting closer to the West and becoming a de facto NATO protectorate. The NATO is actually protecting um, Ukraine. And negotiations failed after Bucha and the sinking of Moscow. There's no way to end the war that way. So Putin right now concentrates on Donbass. Donbass means the um, easternmost uh, two provinces of Ukraine, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, to capture the entire Luhansk and Donetsk provinces and to solidify control of southeastern Ukraine. That would include Kherson, Zaporizhia. Donetsk, Luhansk, part of Kharkiv and Crimea on Krim. Areas with highest concentration of ethnic Russians and Russian speaking population, namely Russification, re-Russification. So what is in the mind of Putin is that he can no longer demilitarize Ukraine. He is going to at least partially re-Russify Ukraine. Now let's take a look at the territories captured by the Russians, right? It's all the way from the east, Kharkiv, and this is Luhansk, Donetsk, this is Zapolizhia, and this is Kherson, and this is Crimea. What does that mean? Let's just bring back the map that we used. This is Ukraine. And this is the dividing line between the uh, southeastern part and northwestern part. So if we put the line dividing the two areas, cultural, linguistic, political, onto this map, we will have, see, here. So Putin is actually aiming at re-Russifying this part of Ukraine. But obviously he can get only 50% roughly of this part. 
And this part has a historical traditional name of Novorossiya. If Putin is successful in conquering the whole of Novorossiya, then Ukraine will become a landlocked country. So that's, that's the objective of Putin. And he has shifted from demilitarization to denazification. Denazification actually means against Ukrainian nationalism, which actually means to re Russify the areas that are already having a lot of Russian speaking people and um, um, uh, Russian minorities. So I'm closing this talk. Uh, this is the most recent situation in Ukraine. As you can see, this is the, the two separatist republics and the Russians have, have uh, moved in from the north and from the south. Now, the Russian goal is to capture the entirety of the Donetsk province because Luhansk province is right now firmly in the hands of the Russians. They have taken uh, Donetsk and, and the Lysychansk. If you, you know, listen to the uh, news uh, recently, you know that they, they did it. Um, um, in, in very uh, rapid succession. Now they want to take the whole of Donetsk. Donetsk is here. And I have taken this part, this part, and a little bit in the north. Now I have to take this one. And especially the center of Donetsk, uh, Donetsk province, Kramatorsk, here. Now Ukraine has a very good chance of holding the multiple defense lines in Donetsk province that are held by the elite joint forces operation. Those forces have been there ever since 2014. It's called the Operatia Abiednanich Sil. So this, this is the area. And this is the line of defense. As you can see, the northern line of defense has been broken by the Russians. The southern line also has been broken by the Russians. But this, the, the center, section of the line has been held uh, very successfully. And this is the special force of Operatia Abidinanich Sil. The forecast is there will be a protracted war of attrition. Russia's goal has been scaled down to capturing Donetsk and all the other fronts it has taken the defensive. Russia's artillery advantage has helped it to capture Slivedunesk and Lysychansk. But that's a small area compared with the conquest of the, of the remaining of the Donetsk province, still 10,000 square kilometers in Ukrainian hands. And it is probable that the battle for Donetsk will take a very long time, months if not years, and the current borderline will evolve into a compact line just like the one existing between 2014 and 2022. So let's be prepared for a protracted war in Ukraine. At the same time, watch out for this. The Russians are aiming for Ukraine, and the PRC aiming for Taiwan. Let's hope it's not going to happen. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Prof. Wu. Very interesting uh, talk, and then it covers, you know, uh, give us a very um, uh, in-depth understanding on the uh, history background and also the divided, you know, uh, annex in uh, Ukraine. And here, I, uh, so now we are coming to the Q&A session. And here I have um, questions posted by Mr. Ronnie Ui. Uh, so um, he asked Prof Wu, why is the Russell-Ukraine war only happened now and not three, four years ago? Could it be, uh, could it be avoided? And also there's a suggestion to split Ukraine into Eastern and Western Bloc, like uh, Germany in the 1970s, uh, actually should be uh, during the Cold War. Lah. Could this be a feasible solution to end the war? 
Okay, should I answer right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. so far we have only yeah, one question here. Okay. Yeah. And the reason for, I think, the war to happen right now has to do with the factors that I have mentioned. Um, namely, um, the Ukrainians are moving closer and closer to NATO. And um, for Putin, this may be the last chance when he will have the chance of stopping that. And at least this is his, his, his mind. And the second one, I think, has a lot to do with the election of Biden. Because Trump really didn't give a damn to Europe. Uh, he thinks that the Europeans are taking advantage of the United States. Um, that, you know, they are not um, providing for their own defenses. And um, um, the U.S. can just leave Europe and leave Europe to, um, to handle their own problems. So if Trump is right now the president of the United States, I don't think that he would respond that strongly. But then Biden is different. Biden was the, the vice president um, of Obama. And uh, Obama sent him as the major envoy of the United States to uh, handle the Ukrainian situation. Actually, you know, his, his son, Hunter Biden, was with him all the time. And that's why Trump attacked Biden, uh, saying that Hunter Biden got himself involved in the financial scandal in Ukraine. So for, from Trump's point of view, the, the, the only value of Ukraine is to implicate, is to, um, is to smear his political opponent, not for something um, inherently to help Ukraine. But then Biden is different. Biden has been so much involved in Ukraine. So after his election, now we notice that um, Putin has been uh, sending a lot of troops surrounding the um, borders of Ukraine. So um, gradually increasing pressure on Ukraine. So I think it has a lot to do with, with Biden. He thinks that Zelensky plus Biden is going to get Ukraine into NATO. And, and finally, of course, Zelensky. Zelensky was a moderate um, presidential candidate compared with Poroshenko. But then, uh, because of the um, structural uh, forces that I have been talking about, he's become more and more tilting towards the nationalist uh, wing. And, and so you, you got this nationalist um, factor, you got the security factor, and finally Putin thinks that if he launches the war to everyone's surprise, then he has the best chance of accomplishing his military goal. But he miscalculated, or should I say he was misadvised because on uh, his uh, military advisor, his defense minister, those people gave him wrong information, particularly, particularly uh, the oligarchs in Ukraine. Um, I learned that they, they took Russian money and they told Putin that if the Russian troops came in, uh, then the Russian speaking people and the Russian ethnic minorities will jump up and welcome the Russian army. That didn't happen. So when the Russians moved in, they thought that they could finish this uh, in, you know, if not um, days, then, then weeks, but they got bogged down in the Ukrainian uh, uh, battlefield. So Putin was, was um, misinformed, but then he had his uh, long-term calculation. Those calculations um, made him um, um, decide to launch the war against Ukraine. And the second question is, could it be possible that the division of Ukraine into southern or uh, southeastern part and northwestern part be a solution? Well, that's exactly in the minds of Putin. He wants to separate Ukraine into two parts. Now he knows that he cannot subjugate the whole country. And, you know, the Western Ukrainian hate the Russians so much that you don't want to put Russian troops on the, the ground of Western Ukraine. So they just concentrate on the eastern part 
um, you have the basis, right? They, they, they speak the same language. Um, um, they um, obviously, they don't like the policies of Kyiv. They voted consistently for pro-Moscow candidates in the elections. So you have a um, much better environment to control this part of Ukraine. And now the problem is just how large would that part of Ukraine be uh, in Putin's imagination. Putin right now considered uh, controlled only about half of the, what I would call uh, uh, Novorossiya, um, namely the southeastern part of Ukraine. So would he want to push further, say into the province of the Nipopetrovsk, of Mykolaiv, of Odessa, uh, would he want to do that? Then that will be, I mean, for years uh, of war to fight. But if he is satisfied with just controlling the entirety of Donbass, now he has captured the whole of Luhansk. He only needs to capture that remaining like 40% of Donetsk. Then he will be in full control of Donbass. And then he will stop. That that's a possibility that, you know, that would be the, the outcome. Probably Zelensky is not going to talk with him, but then we have this, right? And um, Taiwan and mainland China never had a truce, but then the situation went down for more than a decade, uh, uh, more than a uh, half decade. And in the case of uh, Ukraine, probably that will happen. But, you know, for Ukrainian nationalists, this is something that, that they can never accept because you have one quarter or even a half of the uh, country under the occupation of the Russians. So it's, it's, it's not stable, but it might be the um, uh, midterm outcome. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Prof. Wu. That's another question by Kenneth. Uh, he asks, how would history play out differently? Uh, were Russia to join either NATO or the EU in late 1990s? And would Ukraine become the second Afghanistan after the war with the amount of weapons given by the West? Yeah, that is a counterfactual question, which is a very important and interesting one. There was a time when Russia was very susceptible to Western um, influence. Actually, a lot of people, the liberals in, in Russia, um, they, they want to turn Russia into a modern European Western country. Um, but that didn't uh, go well. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, was because Boris Yeltsin was unable to really control the situation in Russia. His economic reform was actually a disaster for a lot of Russian people. Um, and then it's really very difficult for the West to imagine digesting Russia. If you take a look at the map, this is the largest country in the world with a population of even after the um, collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia still has a population of uh, 144 million. Yeah, 144 million people. So it's, it's much larger than any of the European countries. Um, like Germany has only 80, 80, um, 88. And, and uh, Britain, France, and Italy, uh, more than 60. Russia has 144 million. So the West cannot imagine absorbing Russia. They would be afraid of being absorbed by Russia. Um, they do not have the confidence of truly democratizing Russia. They would be afraid of Russia's very deep authoritarian tradition influencing them. So what the West um, ended up doing is to take small um, Central and Eastern European countries into Europe. So you can expand, you know that those countries would follow the Western examples. You know, it's laid down <laughs> very precisely one after another item. You have to fulfill this, 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 and that. 
for you to become a candidate of European Union, and then this, 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 and that, it would take decades. So those countries are willing to transform themselves into the model of Europe. And, and so that's a, um, that's a safer approach, but that safer approach totally antagonized Russia because Russia is left. It's not just left, it's kept outside. So Russia thinks that the whole Europe is getting up against it. And because of that, it's behaving in a quote unquote irrational way. So I really don't think it's possible for the West to truly integrate Russia because of the huge resources, landmass, tradition, cultural, political system, etc., of Russia. And, um, and I'm sorry, the second question is... Uh, would Ukraine become the second Afghanistan after the war with the amount of weapons given by the West? Uh, uh, would Ukraine become the next what? Afghanistan. Oh, uh, Afghanistan. Yes. Okay. Well... Um, obviously, in Afghanistan, you have very strong religious forces and, you know, Muslims, etc. You don't have that in Ukraine, but you do have very strong ideologies, nationalisms that would keep the, the people fighting. Um, um, would, would the war in Ukraine drag that long? I don't know, because the war in Afghanistan dragged on for how many years, like 20? I mean, it's really, it's, it's very difficult to predict at this point, but it is possible that the conflict would um, drag on and on and on, because you have very strong nationalism on both sides. And, and even though Ukraine is weaker, it is supported by the West. So that compensates for the weakness of Ukraine. But then if Ukraine and the West are going to overwhelm Russia, then Russia has its nuclear weapons. So any encroachment into the territory of Russia would touch off a nuclear exchange, which the West would want to uh, avoid. And also standing behind Russia is China. So I think it's very difficult to either side to overwhelm completely the other side. It's, it's possible that the current line of contact would evolve into a more permanent uh, border. Right now, Russia is sending, is issuing passports to any Ukrainian interested in getting one. And this is called passportization. If you get a passport from the Russian Federation and you're a citizen, of Russia and Russia has obligation to protect you. And if he sends a lot of passports to the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians probably because they want, you know, I want my pension, I want this or that benefits. So I um, apply for a passport. Then by holding a passport, you will become a traitor of Ukraine, which means that those people will become hostages of Russia. They would have to support Russia because the coming back of the Ukrainian government may put them on trial. So, you know, those people sandwiched, caught between the two uh, states are the most miserable. I mean, they are, they are trying to fight for their lives, struggling, leaving their countries and tilting to with this or the other side. Um, would would cost you probably your lives. So it's it's really the population that is suffering the most. Uh, okay. So Afghanistan, I don't know, but but in in the in the midterm, I think stagnation along the current borderline is highly possible. Okay, thanks, Prof. Uh, I here I have another long uh, two questions from uh, Ng Yok Chi. Uh, First question, what is your inclined interpretations of the cause of war? Stephen Hawking's historical reason or Mill Shimer's security view? You mean uh, which one is more important? Yeah, which one is your take? Yeah, which one you think play a more important role 
in causing leading the the, the war. Uh, you mean the historical reason mm. and the, the security oh, reason? Yeah. Uh, okay. I would think uh, security reason probably is more important, and the uh, national reason is um, in part used to uh, mobilize the Russian people to support the war. I, I don't think Putin is really interested in occupying Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing for Putin to do is you have a subservient government in Kiev, mm -hmm. a, a government that is willing to cooperate with Moscow. And, and probably bringing Ukraine into the Eurasian Economic Union, just like Belarus, right? <laughs> you have Lukashenko in Belarus. That is very good. <laughs> Belarus listens to Putin. <laughs> so if you have a guy, uh, Yanukovych in, in control, who can govern the nation for Putin, wouldn't that be great? And, and actually, this is the calculation of the West. They want a pro-Western government in Kiev. Um, so I think that that's, that's the major consideration. Um, but but of, of course, there would be grievances. Um, you know, I think if you have Russian minorities or Russian-speaking people in Ukraine who have grievances, but then if the country is very closely allied with Moscow, then Moscow won't put great pressure on Ukraine because the happiness of the Russian people in Ukraine uh, may be less important than the security consideration of Russia. So um, Kazakhstan, for example, not actually deal with the Russian people that great. But there has been very little quarrel between Kazakhstan and Russia be because Kazakhstan, especially uh, Nusultan Nazarbayev, the, the former president, has been such a good friend of Putin. Mm. So, we, you know, you, you don't find, you don't hear a lot of these things going on. So I think security reason probably is more important than nationalism. But nationalism is a genuine one. Okay. So for, uh, one thing suddenly come uh, you know, out of my mind, uh, since just now you mentioned about Belarus, why didn't Putin, uh, you know, like encourage or support uh, a pro-Russia politicians in Ukraine? Why Putin not Yeah, support? Putin is like support because like, uh, just like you explained just now, like after 20, 2014, actually, uh, many pro-Russian politicians, actually, they have left Ukraine, right? So there's left, like those like pro uh pro-West politicians and it they actually you know and make uh things become worse so why didn't like you know after 2014 that you know putting uh he encouraged and support um those like, pro-Russian politicians yeah in Ukraine well he, he actually did and he I think he bribed many of the oligarchs <laughs> okay. um, in Russia but the problem is um because uh, Russia has already taken Ukrainian lands, uh, Crimea and Luhansk, Donetsk, these two separate re republics. So if you are in the middle of the political spectrum, your sympathy will be with, with Ukrainian nationalists. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is um, the, the patriotic education. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Ukraine wants to, to develop its own uh, national identity. <laughs> So this, this education textbooks, um, it, it takes a stronger and a stronger root among the Ukrainian youth. Uh, the old generation, they had experience of living in the Soviet Union. Some of them even had memory, if not actually fought during World War II. So the Russians and Ukrainians, they are together to fight the Nazis. So it has this brotherhood feeling. But then after the independence, everything changed. Ukraine has evolved more and more into independent identity. 
And, and so from Putin's perspective, you know, if you really, if you do not do something decisive, he has uh, less and less ability to influence Ukrainian politics through peaceful means. Finally, I would say it's really the lack of economic uh, leverages that Russia cannot win the minds and hearts of the Ukrainian people. Russia is strong in military, is strong in energy, but it is not strong in um, cultural, in economic um, benefits. So if a realistic thinking Ukrainian is uh, to make a decision between Russia and the West, and he will think, which side can give me more uh, material benefits? Uh, would I be living under much better condition if I join uh, the Russians or joining the Europeans? And, and I think the choice is very simple. So time is not on Putin's side. And, and military means probably is the only thing at his disposal. So he would have to do it swiftly um, before the time, the opportunity slips away. Uh, so from this perspective, Russia is actually behaving from a position of weakness, not strength. This is quite different from uh, the People's Republic of China because China has amassed huge wealth uh, which uh, Russia lacks. R Russia's uh, GDP right now is about the same as South Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, wait. Uh, sorry that uh, on your key, I will come back to your questions later. I will ask uh, Sun's question first. Huh? So giving the Russia-Ukrainian war has caused the food security and also energy security. Uh, it's actually food crisis and energy crisis a lot of countries, the world could not wait for the war to end as the outcome of the war, uh, uh, wait now, let me <laughs> restructure, okay? So the war has, caught, uh, has caused food crisis and energy crisis to uh, many countries, right? So uh, many countries, they can't actually wait uh, the war to end to fulfill Putin's interests. Do you think China will eventually um, coming in to negotiate, be the middleman, you know, to end the war. And yeah. And then second, since China is trying to modify the world, what does this mean? Since China is trying to modify the world institution recently, uh, I think this is more about um, uh, asking your opinion about China, uh, like modifying or, you know, like changing a world institution, you know, it, it has uh, its own system. Yeah, I think this audience also is asking for your uh, opinion on this. Okay, I'm not... Um, I'm also I'm not quite really clear sure. about the second question. <laughs> yeah, the first yeah, I'm not quite yeah. sure. <laughs> The, the first question, I think, yes, indeed, uh, Xi Jinping has not been, uh, well, from uh, the West's point of view, China has already taken the Russian side because it's not um, energetically um, uh, participating in Western sanctions against Russia. Uh, it has not stopped buying Russian gas and oil and so on and so forth, but it has been, you know, like taking advantage of that and get um, those Russian energy that, energies at um, um, bargain price. Um, but from the Chinese point of view, they have not actively supporting Russia. Uh, they have not, um, for example, um, provided weapons to the Russians. Uh, so militarily concerned, Russia is not an active supporter of Russia. But obviously Moscow would be very grateful to China because China has not participated in the economic sanctions against um, uh, Moscow. Um, and, and China has been maintaining relationship with Ukraine. And this is very interesting because 
China's position has been described, it's very pro-Russia. And yet, Ukraine has never denounced China. Uh, it seems that Ukraine would want to keep good relationship with China. This may have to do with not antagonizing China so that China will not directly help Russia. It may also have to do with in the post-war reconstruction of the country, probably they will need Chinese capital. And it also has to do with the fact that the two countries have had very good relationship. You know, the Valiang, the, um, uh, the first uh, Chinese carrier was actually a uh, Soviet um, era carrier that has been sold to uh, 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 China as a piece of you know, junk iron. <laughs> and then the Chinese modeled it and, and turned it into Liaoninghao, the first Chinese carrier. Mm -hmm. so, so the two sides had, had good relationships. Um, so Xi Jinping would want to keep that relationship. And obviously he would not put great pressure on Russia. And probably when the two sides are so exhausted and the situation has become um, optimal, then the Chinese would move in and ask the Russians, um, so <laughs> you're not going to get more land. Uh, you want me to pass a message to the Ukrainians to see if they also want to um, end the war and they would talk to the Ukrainians. I know you are very brave and so on and so forth, but you, only, you know that you're not going to uh, defeat the Russians. So do you want to, you know, the Russians are asking me to send a message to you. Would you be willing to um, begin this negotiation or whatever? So to, to, to become a go-between. then. If China can do that and can dramatically enhance its strategic position on the um, on global scale, um, it will become a very important actor. But, but right now, the two sides have not been exhausted. So I think China is waiting. Okay. And the other thing is a lot of people are speculating that probably China is going to take advantage of the situation, do something with Taiwan. Uh, which I, I don't think so. Uh, first of all, uh, never, never before the 20th Party Congress <laughs> that would determine Xi Jinping's political fate. And even after that, I think um, they know that the Americans are very conscious of this possibility. So unless the People's Liberation Army can uh, uh, give... Um, Xi Jinping 100% confidence that they would be able to do it swiftly, unlike the Russians, um, then they would um, continue building up their military for a better time in the future. So I think this is China's um, a policy, wait and see, especially, definitely before the 20th Congress. Mm. Okay, so first of all, I have a question here also again from Ang Yoksi. Uh, it's related to Taiwan. How should Taiwan respond to Chinese aggression? If we buy the idea that Russian invasion is triggered by security concern, that Ukraine will be safe if the government is pro-Russia, then logically we shall prod Taiwanese government to be pro-PRC, distancing itself from the West. But should we? Or shoring up Western alliance present in the region is a much better containment strategy. So what do you think about Taiwan, you know? <laughs> um, well, I think the best strategy for Taiwan probably is to really um, um, build up its military preparedness, but not as a uh, way of antagonizing China, but as a way of, you know, deterring China. Because the um, uh, Ukrainian example has clearly shows that it can be very messy, even for the invaders. Yeah. And invaders can, cannot have full confidence of the outcome of the war. Um, 
before it, a, a war actually breaks out. So I think it would add a lot of uncertainty in the minds of the planners uh, of the PLA and Taiwan should add to those planners. Um, and the other thing is, uh, if Taiwan really wants to antagonize Beijing, then from the Ukrainian uh, example, uh, we know exactly what are the things that would provoke Beijing. For example, to form a, a military alliance with the United States, um, to have American boots on the ground in Taiwan, mm. to have American military bases in Taiwan, mm. But then if Taiwan is uh, improving its own military preparedness by, you know, buying some Western weapons or developing some of its own uh, military, uh, you know, weapons and um, its, its um, uh, recruitment and so on and so forth, that would be less um, provoking to Beijing. Um, and and also, Beijing is extremely sensitive to Taiwan's relationship with Japan because of World War II. Mm -hmm. So Taiwan should be really careful. And finally, domestic politics in Ukraine plays into the hand, actually, of the uh, warmongers on the other side. Uh, because you, you want to get votes, right? So you, you want to be very fervently uh, nationalistic and you speak the rhetoric. And, you know, Russia always criticized Ukraine for a lot of a bunch of Nazi and politicians, uh, the Azov Battalion, the Aida Battalion, the right sector, and so on and so forth. Uh, so those elements, highly Taiwanese, nationalistic, highly anti Chinese um, language policies, those are the things. If you, if you um, talk a, uh, a lot about that, uh, you are going to increase the temperature. So there are things that within the Taiwan's power that can be done or should, um, Taiwan should refrain from doing um, mm -hmm. if it does not want to repeat the uh, Ukrainian scenario. But we cannot exclude the possibility that even with Taiwan doing all the right things, that there will not be an attack on Taiwan from the PRC, simply because, you know, unification is such mm -hmm. a sacred goal uh, on the Chinese mainland. Okay. okay, I think, yeah, I think that's all for all the questions posted by the audience and participants. Yeah, so it, uh, we are coming to an end of our, our webinar. Okay, we thank uh, Professor Wu. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Thank Wu. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, okay. My great pleasure. Okay, okay thank you.